Excellent. I guess the ICU team is here, so we can start. Uh, they said they'll be here 12.14. They're a minute late. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to the uh, to this uh, grand round. And I know people came actually on their off day. Thank you for that. That means a lot. Um, so let's start with some uh, with something. Okay, uh, disclosure, I speak for two pharmaceutical companies. They, they both make epilepsy anti-seizure uh, medications. However, there will be really no discussion of any seizure medicine in particular during this presentation So, or, or any device for that matter. It's gonna be uh, really a general talk. Why did we uh, decide to do this topic? Um, well, our colleagues in the ICU, um, rightfully so, um, wanted this talk to happen because there are a lot of discrepancy between what neurology do with their uh, status patients. It's not only the ICU team, they are physicians, the internal medicine, family medicine, they just don't understand why we defer as neurologists so much in treating the status. Like specifically, why, when do we start what, like a medication? Um, how long? Why did we pick this specific medication? Uh, why did we pick, uh, pick to monitor this specific patient with EEG and not the other one? Um, how come we have birth suppression on this one, but not on the other? Why did we keep this one for three days and the other one for 12 day, 12 hours? So the objective of this talk is really not to go like method methodical status epilepticus, you know, um, uh, what does it mean? Uh, this is how we treat it. Uh, this is the prognosis. You can find this in any textbook. However, instead, we're going to go to what do we really know about status epilepticus in terms of evidence-based medicine? What do we practice as evidence-based? What do we practice as not evidence-based and why? And to do this, we're going to go to the um, basics of, uh, review some basics of status epilepticus. We're going to review a some current medical literature, try to come to some sort of a conclusion to, clarify, to clear the, um, the discrepancies. So status plepticus uh, is the second most frequent neurological emergency after stroke, 25 in 100,000 annual uh, cases. Um, Refractory is when we give already benzos and at least one anti-seizure medication load appropriately, but we're still having um, status ongoing. And it's usually one third of the um, uh, total status cases become refractory. The etiology is determined only in half of the cases, at least initially, which is uh, not a good thing. Um, the fatality for the refractory status epilepticus is about 30%, uh, which is about um, three times higher than the non-refractory status epilepticus mortality rate. For most cases, surprisingly, the death does not occur during the status, but you know, sometimes a um, long time after cessation of status epilepticus, which brings us to the most important thing on this slide, time and time again, we see that the prognosis for any status is really not how long the seizure was going on, but instead what was the etiology of it and what was the age of the patient over and over again. These are the uh, consistent identified um, causes for um, outcome. This was an interesting uh, talk in the, um, in the meeting in Salzburg, and I'd like to put it for two reasons. First, to tell Jake that I was in that meeting, and the second, because I thought it was fascinating. So uh, uh, Aidan Nilligan presented his uh, publication in JAMA, and what he did, he said, okay, let's see over the last 30 um, years whether we improved the outcome of status epilepticus with all the advances that we have, right? 30 years ago and now. So he said, okay, I'm gonna pick studies and do meta-analysis. He picked 61 studies from only 
high income countries because he wanted to get rid of dis disparities in access, medications, access to care, technology, etc. So he picked only these uh, studies from um, high income countries. And then he had very stringent criteria, like he excluded any study with less than 30 participants and uh, less than 20 in case of refractory status epilepticus. Also, he excluded them if they have a single specific etiology or a single treatment modality. So he found 61 um, studies between 1990 and 2017. Uh, two thirds of them were retrospective, which is actually not a bad um, ratio. Um, so he looked main, the main outcome he looked at was the, um, he made the, the in-hospital mortality or 30 day uh, case fatality rate. The shocking conclusion was despite 30 years of advances in technology, new medications, better monitoring, identifying these patients, et cetera, better ICUs, um, no evidence that we have improved the survival uh, over that time. Stayed like, you know, so this slide by itself will tell you why neurology defer. We really, I mean, we, we do not have, we do not have evidence-based um, guideline. We, we had a diarrhea of stroke cases for the last three days. I'm sorry. All right. So um, if, Honestly, beyond the first line of action, which are which, uh, benzos, um, we do not have any evidence based um, for any treatment, like uh, seizure medications, uh, anesthetics, EEG, whatever. So that may be, they may come shocking to, to most people in this room because we've always learned, oh, we're in charge of status. This is what we do, one, two, three. This is what we do, EEG, we do birth suppression, et cetera. Um, yeah, we don't have any evidence base. So this is why the mortality didn't change um, over 30 years. And why don't we have evidence base with, for the second most important neurologic emergency? Because it takes a lot to, um, to, to have a clinical trial. Like for example, if you, if you need a three arm trial investigating one second line anti-seizure medication, you're gonna need approximately 1500 enrollees um, to detect a difference that may be potentially significant. And if you think, okay, a high volume tertiary center sees an average 50 to 70 status um, yearly, um, at, at best, if you're going to recruit one third, one, one fourth of these, um, you will need 50 high volume centers recruiting for two years to complete one trial. And this is why we don't have that many um, evidence based uh, or trial dealing with this problem. So what really, what do we have then uh, when we talk about medicinal management of status epilepticus? Um, I just wanna put this, um, and I want you just to pay attention to the red um, writings. Uh, usually we define T1 as when uh, seizure beyond this time is not gonna stop on its own. So beyond this time, we need to do something for this seizure to stop. Most seizure takes two, maybe three minutes to stop. So once we pass, usually you say five minutes, then you know that if you don't do anything, this is going into status. That's T1. T2 is a little bit more complex. It's T2 is when we know beyond this time, um, there is a deleterious effect of seizure on the brain, like neuronal death start happening, um, a toxic uh, materials start appearing in the brain, et cetera. So if you remember, T1 is actually when, when status is diagnosed, it's not gonna stop when we need to do something. T2 is when we are having, uh, starting to have some brain effect in terms of uh, neuronal death, et cetera, and toxicity. So what's the problem with this? The problem is, I mean, we know in, in um, tonic-clonic status, once, once you reach three to five minutes, it's not going to stop. Everybody knows this. Everybody observe it. And we know 
at 30 minutes, if we don't stop this status, neuronal death and stuff is going to happen. Now, here's the interesting part and the dilemma. Once you go down to non-convulsive and absence, which is part of non-convulsive, we really don't know what's T1 and T2. So we, we don't know if the non-convulsive status is going to stop at its own at some point if we don't treat it. We don't know that time. And if it goes for a day or two, are we really doing damage to the brain or not? We really don't know. There is no clear evidence for it. What's the second problem with, with T2? This is the time where we, we, need, we start having some problems with neuronal death. However, um, when you look at this, does it really matter at the end? Yeah, in the lab or you know, some study showed that it's okay. We have toxic um, products, we have neuronal death, but some, some large studies, um, they failed actually to see any independent association with the duration of status epilepticus and clinical outcome like weeks after the, the status is, is, um, is over. So we are dealing with, with really some major dilemmas that um, you know some people would like to be more aggressive than others because of that, but we will mention this in a minute. Now I put this for a reason. This is the recommendation from the um, American Epilepsy Society on what to do and how like, you know, uh, in different stages. And I put it for two reasons. One, to show the dosages, and the second, to show you how much um, the acknowledgement by the American Epilepsy Society that we don't have a lot of evidence base. So we all know the, the zero to five, which is actually seizure in progression. And then after five, this is what T, T1 status happening. So benzos, which is the, the only strong evidence-based we, we have in the market. And then once we, we go 20 to 40 minutes, this is established, uh, starting to become intractable. The statement here says there is no evidence um, based um, evidence based on the preference second anti seizure medication. This is why you see some people load cap. It's it's the easiest, quickest. Uh, some people load something else, etc. Um, look at the dosages: forty milligram per kilogram <clears throat> per valproic acid, sixty milligram per gram for, for capra, and then here, if status persists we absolutely have no, no clear evidence for anything at this point. You can load another seizure medicine, you can jump to anesthetic medications, we don't have it. This is AES 2016. So, um, so it's not as easy as we, um, we think. Um, we have the strongest evidence, like I said, for benzos. And I just elected, there are many articles, but this one in New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at patients who, um, who are picked up by ambulances. Um, if they have seizures lasting more than five minutes, they meet the definition of status. So the, um, the, the paramedics are allowed to administer blindly that the paramedics didn't know which, what are they administering either two milligram of Ativan IV, five milligram of diazepam IV or placebo IV. And of course they found uh, looking at the outcome, um, how soon the, the status uh, stopped upon arrival to the emergency department, they, they saw 30% more patient uh, that received benzos, either um, lorazepam or um, diazepam. Um, were seizure free upon arrival to the ED that translate to roughly four times more likely to be discharged home from the emergency department and 50% less likely to uh, require an ICU admission. Jumping to the second wave, this is anti-seizure medications now. Um, and again, like, like I said, how difficult the trials are. Look at, look at these years of publication, 2018, 2019, 2020. I'm seriously, I mean, it's not until now that we started having some evidence based that phosphinitoin, valproic acid, levetiracetam, they're the same. They're all similar in treating status epilepticus. You can load with, with whichever one. Um, Lacosamide, um, you know, the same. So this is the evidence we have right now that these medications are the same, basically. 
this study, I think this is the, if you want to remember one slide from this presentation, this is it. I thought this is a very interesting study published in 2019. They actually looked at factors predicting cessation of status epilepticus. They looked at um, more than a thousand cases over four and a half years. The findings were shocking in terms of the boluses given uh, were lower than the recommended guidelines that I just showed you with the American Ep Society in a three quarter of the time. And what's, what's worse is they actually found that if you give the right dose, which is the higher dose, it's correlate with a quicker and cessation of status epilepticus. So if there is one thing we're gonna do, I mean, just use the right loading dose. Don't be scared to use like 40 milligram per kilogram of, of um, valproic acid, 60 milligram per kilogram for um, a levetiracetam max of 450. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Now, what do we have as evidence base for the third wave of medications? Um, we don't, we just, again, just like the second wave, we know that midazolam, propofol, theopental, they're all the same. Uh, theopental have more side effects, um, you know, leukopenia, infections, hypotension, et cetera. And the recommendation is basically uh, use midazolam with or without propofol just because theopental is having more side effects. This is all what we have. So what's the problem with the anesthetic medication, using the anesthetics in status epilepticals? Um, in the last few years, there's more and more evidence that actually these medications are harmful and not helpful for these patients. And this is the case we're building. Uh, this is a poster presented in one of the American Epilepsy Society, I think five or six years ago. Uh, Dr. Waterhouse from the Virginia Commonwealth University gave me permission to uh, use it actually, and she sent the poster and some. I like this, although it's a one patient, but I like it because you're comparing the same patient who came twice to the emergency department three months apart with the same presentation. The patient has a stroke on MRI and um, he came with expressive aphasia and the EEG showed the same left temporal status epilepticus. So focal status epilepticus in the language area, the patient is hemodynamically stable. Two teams took care of the patient, one aggressive team and uh, one um, uh, conservative team. So you can see on the left, the non-IC admission with the dealt with the non-aggressive team. They started loading anti-epileptic medications, Day after day, EEG kept showing the uh, status focal. They kept loading. Um, day nine, seizure stopped. Uh, LPDs continued. The um, aphasia continued because you know that's another thing. It may take days before uh, symptom before the um, uh, patient regains baseline. And at day um, sixteen, the pa everything resolved. Patient was discharged home. Now the ICU admission, the patient came, same presentation, same MRI, no new stroke, same EEG. They loaded with Topamax, uh, status continued. They decided to go aggressive. They um, electively intubated. They started pentobarb um, and things went downhill. Hypotension, renal failure, um, infections, uh, C. diff, trach, PEG, um, patient went uh, to nursing home. Um, so this is a summary. The first lasted 16 days, the second admission 36. This is the cost and um, the disposition home versus a nursing home skilled nurse uh, facility. Uh, if you don't like just single cases, this is a, a case that looked at 171 patients um, Thirty-seven percent of them treated with um, IV anesthetics. Um, published in Neurology in 2014, they looked at these patients between 25 and 2011, um, and the conclusion: patient with um, anesthetic drugs, independent of possible confounders, they corrected for all the. Uh, they used the progression model um, to correct for any possible confounders like a duration on severity of status and critical uh, medical condition. 
they found that people who we used um, anesthetic drugs on, they're more infection during the uh, status, longer ICU stay, and uh, almost three times uh, higher uh, to uh, die. And this is the um, table from this study. What's, what's actually funny is uh, seizure control wasn't even better with the anti-anesthetics, uh, but death was a hospital stay and, of course, uh, discharge home. Um, another study um, looked at adult uh, in the NICU at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, analyzed all um, refractory status between 99 and 2011. They excluded anoxic, of course, and uh, psychogenic, simple partial. The main outcome, again, the uh, rankings, modified ranking scale, like functional outcome. They looked at 63 consecutive cases. The conclusion, again, achieving control of status epilepticus without requiring that drug-induced coma or severe EEG suppression uh, portend better outcome. So this is great. So now we are talking that we shouldn't use birth, I mean, birth suppression. That's another thing we need to look at now. It's not only the anesthetic medication. So um, more and more evidence uh, started coming and then people started writing expert opinions. This is from 2021 and 2023. I can just read them. Basically, it's saying the use of uh, therapeutic coma as a routine treatment remains debated. Um, several studies have suggested that therapeutic coma may be um, independently associated with increased mortality rate um, and a significant prolongation hospital stay without any observ observable benefits on survival. Another one, in cases where there is no history of convulsions or when seizure activity exclusively non-convulsive, maybe adding a non-sedating anti-seizure medication maybe as a, a better alternative and a less aggressive option. Um, I promised we we're going to look at the birth suppression now because one study started mentioning it. So uh, what is what is birth suppression? Uh, it's usually when you have, uh, I mean, it started in a in a early 20th centuries uh, when clinicians first observed that um, there's a, a brief period of electrical silence um, on the EEG were associated with reduced seizures. It wasn't until the 60s and 70s when people start um, intentionally introducing it as a, a, a mean of um, treating status epilepticus. The pioneer work of um, Williams, um, William Copland and um, Van der Velden demonstrated that it could effectively control seizures. And then later with uh, Tasker and Penry, started to have some um, protocols to uh, to treat people with status epilepticus using birth suppression. And today it stayed as a vital tool of management uh, by the American Epilepsy Society. So you can see they're mainly um, opinions of, you know, people who treated seizures and there is no trial, nothing, but somehow it made it to the, um, to the management al algorithm. So what is birth suppression? It's when you usually, you have more than 50% of your EEG, less than 10 microvolts um, that alternating with bursts, um, typically maintained 24 to 30, 48 hours <clears throat> as per the American Epilepsy Society recommendation, they say 24 to 48. Um, the, so it stayed as a um, recommendation by the International League Against Epilepsy and the American Epilepsy Society. Uh, the ideal ratio, uh, they recommend four to one or five to one that translate to one second burst every 10 seconds of EEG. Um, and um, this, uh, and the rationale for this is said to be balancing, this is a balanced ratio to ensure effective seizure control while avoiding excessive suppression. That's a rationale. 
I'm not going to bore you with this, uh, like what's the wisdom behind birth suppression and how it works and how it may be working. But um, I think the last point here is important because it, it looks like whenever we put somebody in birth suppression, it looks like hands off, we're good, let's wait, watch now for 24, 48 hours. Instead, we, we neglect to um, address the most relevant or important things like looking for an etiology for the status and treating that, uh, reevaluate, looking for lab tests, doing more testing, imaging, and um, see if we our treatment is um, actually effective in the first place. Um, now, we still we still don't know, we still have question about the efficacy of, of status epileptica, I'm, I'm sorry, for birth suppression. Uh, the extent of suppression, like, you know, is 50% enough? Do we suppress more, less? We don't know. For how long? We don't know. There are studies that say maybe two hours is enough. Some studies says that we can use uh, suppression for two hours, and it showed to be beneficial, actually, in stopping some non-convulsive status epilepticus. Um, there is still, as I mentioned, uh, uncertainty about the optimal length and how soon or how quickly we should taper the, the medication, the anesthetic drugs. And the, the other problem is, do we, are we really uh, achieving um, the goal of, of birth suppression? This study was um, published by the uh, Mass General Hospital in 2018. They looked at um, 35 consecutive patients with status epilepticus, and these are the drugs that these 35 patients were on. And they wanted to see how successful they were in um, achieving an acceptable range of birth suppression between 65 to 95 suppression. They, they uh, put their goal. And um, they tried to be really very uh, pure in their selection. They excluded um, uh, 30 minutes before or after changing of any infusion or bolus, and they collected their data only when the constant dose of IV and anesthetic uh, was on for at least two hours. The, again, the shocking thing is like we actually reach uh, the goal of birth suppression in only 8% of the time in their study, which makes you think, okay, uh, are we doing it right? Is this why it's not working or what? more and more mysteries. Um, this is a study published in Archive Neurology, looked at 127 consecutive refractory cases, uh, I mean episodes. Um, they looked at the mortality and return to functional baseline. This um, what was analyzed um, and looking at the, the anesthetic um, treatment and the EEG birth suppression, both. So um, the conclusion was um, independent of the specific uh, coma-induced Asian, the, the anesthetic, and independent of the extent of EEG birth suppression, um, the, the outcome didn't matter. It was independent of, of both. So again, suggesting treating the cause and underlying cause uh, instead of focusing on the um, anesthetic agent and the birth suppression itself. Whenever I go to AES, um, there's always this debate and I learned quickly any, for any conference, if I have any debate, not to go to it because if we have evidence based for anything, there wouldn't be a debate, right? So you can see always two epileptologists going at each other. One of them say birth suppression and the other one say only seizure suppression, don't, don't, suppress, the, don't suppress the EEG. So um, the, the patient, this, is, this study in JAMA showed that patients who were treated without targeting birth suppression fared better than those who, target, who had uh, birth suppression. Then very recent study, um, this was published actually in Neurology 2023 and commented on in um, New England Journal of Medicine. It made it all the way there. It was commented on with, uh, with one full page. It looked at 147 refractory cases. Um, there was 
uh, no association with um, with birth suppression, with seizure termination or survival. And this is the statement from the um, New England Journal of Medicine. They cited the study and uh, basically they say seizure cessation with anesthetics might be um, a better EEG endpoint than um, birth suppression. It was a very well done study um, they looked actually the outcome were beautiful seizure termination in hospital survivor and return to baseline and neural functions. Um, 147 patient is a fair number of patients. Um, and um, later on, these are again expert opinions that their Dr. Young uh, is, is a well-known in the epilepsy business. He said, basically, I put these statements as I um, as they are in the in the journal. The, he said, given the lack of significant benefit and the noted disadvantage and complication uh, attribute to birth suppression, most neurologists were probably it's true. I, I had to Google this word. Uh, refrain from um, achieving birth suppression from now on uh, with patients with refractory status epilepticus. Same thing, um, you, you can see that's another um, expert opinion from 2023. Um, he said we, he's not going to be against the use, usage of anesthetic medication, but instead of going all the way to birth suppression, maybe we should just control the seizure without suppressing the EEG all the way. Um, I put this because it's also a point of um, confusion, like, okay, we are, we are monitoring somebody with a status epilepticus, we decrease the medication, they come back and seizure. How long do we really should keep the treatment going on? So the, the agreement is, the long-lasting refractory status epilepticus is for sure um, is a poor prognosis by itself. However, uh, if you have like uh, a, a young patient, um, maybe those with infections, autoimmune etiology, you should be a little bit more patient with those, especially, especially if neuroimaging remains relatively normal, no good underlying etiology that actually carries a poor prognosis, like, you know, uh, rapidly progressive tumors, uh, paraneoplastic uh, limbic encephalitis, um, cancer, prion disease, etc., and anoxic injury. And the last, uh, the final third of this talk is about the confusing ICU EEG patterns. I mean, I hear this. Uh, I used to hear it a lot. I think our ICU team is more polite. They don't make it. The, the, the verbiage that we sometimes um, put in an EEG report is confuses the heck out of people who are reading it sometimes in the ICU. We use like these um, expression, ectal and rectal continuum on the verge of stuff. What does that mean? I mean, do we treat what, what, what exactly that? And it's becoming really a, very used. Like, you know, we use it all the time. I'm ask Jake, he's in the back, he use it more than me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, where did this come in, in the final few years, uh, you know, American Epilepsy Society, Clinical Neurophysiology Society added a lot of verbiage to the patterns. Um, you know, I mean, look at this, it's just scary. I, I don't, I mean, it, it's crazy. And they added plus now, you know, this is new, like in addition to LPDs, GPDs, RDAs, serpids, you have to add plus and after the plus it's F, R or S, whether you have, you know, sharps, fast activity or it, it, it be, it's out of control. Yeah, we can, we can use it and epileptologists included in their report, but what does it really mean to the practicing physician? What does it mean to the ICU team? What does it mean to the um, to the neurologist taking care of the of the patient? So the problem is this. Well, when Jake one time showed me, um, actually he showed me a, a a better picture than this. It was more complex, but uh, we we quickly reached the conclusion that the more complex the picture and the more colors you have to be in it, the more likely we don't know what the heck we're doing. 
because if it's simple, you you shouldn't have that, you know, diver I mean, look at that. So basically here on this, on the right hand side, you have the seizures, right? We should treat. On this side, we're good, the, the cool blue uh, color. In the middle here, no one knows what, what's going on in this, in this box. So periodic discharges, rhythmic delta, some, I mean, okay, they say, okay, when you have a rhythmic discharge of one hertz, when it approaches 2.5 hertz, then it's definitely a seizure. Yeah, so what do I do when I start the EEG and I'm seeing one hertz or what, do, do I wait until it's three hertz? What do I do? Uh, no plus is better than pluses. Fluctuating is worse than static. And then you have here the birds with a brief ectal rhythmic discharges that doesn't, they don't last more than, 10 seconds, which technically you can't even call them seizure, but they are seizure. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's like a mathematical problem, like deal with it. Um, okay, well, that's the one. So this was done with fluorodeoxyglucose. So the more uptake, the more hot the region, the more ectal it is. So you can see on the right hand side, non-convulsive, convulsive, and um, epilepsia partialis continua. On the left, you have the uh, rhythmic delta. In the middle, you have all these uh, lateralized periodic discharges, serpent, et cetera. So again, that doesn't tell me what shall I do with this. There are two important slides that I put. I mean, there are probably the most important in this presentation in terms of what to do with this pattern. This one is actually very useful for the practicing physician here because it's identify four, four scenarios where you cause a status epilepticus without a doubt. The first one, any rhythmic pattern more than 2.5 Hertz. Even if it's at the beginning of the, you start the EEG and you see this pattern, if it's 2.5 or above, this is status epilepticus. Now, if, if it's less than 2.5 Hertz, it's slower, However, you see some, um, what we call uh, evolution. Evolution can be with rhythmicity, evolution with uh, location, um, evolution with um, the frequency. Once you see that evolution, you call it a seizure as well. So the problem is you start an EEG on somebody in the ICU and they are less than 2.5 and they already have this and you don't know whether they had evolution before or not, right? In this case, you'll have, to, um, you'll have to do a couple of things. You either give a challenge with Ativan or, or an anti-seizure medication, and you'll have to look not only for a seizure to be suppressed on EEG, but also an improvement uh, clinically with the patient. Because a lot of uh, patterns in the ICU are rhythmic, and most of them, when you give Ativan, they kind of change. I don't want to say resolve, but they change. And when... If you have a change without a clinical improvement, you don't know whether you just to change the EG pattern to a more encephalopathic one, or it was a resolution of, of a seizure without a patient improving clinically. And the last, the last one here, if any pattern with any rhythmicity, um, you know, with any fast or slow, but with each charge, you see a clinical evidence of a twitching or so, the patient is doing something with it. So these four you call you call immediately status. The rest is just not. I mean, it's confusing. I, I mean, look look at here. It says possible electrographic seizure. I mean, there is nothing more that somebody hates. If if you have a mathematic brain and you like things either yes or no, no gray, this is a nightmare. I can't say possible status. Am I going to treat or not? What shall I do? So it wasn't until this study came um, in 2017. I, 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 honest to God, I don't think I love more study than this one. Um, it looked at 4,772 4, patients. This is a lot of patients. And you can be confident when you see that many patients studied that you have a result that kind of makes sense. Like you can include it in your practice. It pub published in a good journal. They looked at all these uh, patterns um, the, the repetitive pattern. And the best thing is here in red, generalized rhythmic delta and stimulus in, induced rhythmic um, 
epileptiform disorders were not associated with seizure. We see these all the time. And they used to be nightmare. The nurse come, they stimulate the patient in the middle of the night. You see a seizure. You definitely you really see like just a rhythmic pattern. And anything associated with uh, serpids, stimulus induced, we don't worry about at the moment. It's a sigh of relief, honestly. Now, the rest, um, once you have LPDs or LPD plus um, reaching 1, 1 1.5 hertz, you should treat for the um, generalized periodic discharges, usually give a little bit more, maybe two, uh, two hertz until you start treating them. So it was a good study. I, I use it a lot in the practice. Now, th this is for everyone in the audience. We, it's a reminder to me and everyone that we don't treat EEG, we treat patients. And this is a, a case that I, I saw, um, you know, it's one of my patients and um, it was in Michigan. And you look at this pattern here, an ICU patient, honestly, the, I, I don't see rhythmicity. I don't see a recurrent pattern, no definite sharps. It looks encephalopathic pattern, generalized um, slowing and the theta and delta range. But the patient was acting, um, you know, there was no reason for them to be encephalopathic. They were fluctuating, et cetera. So we decided to give a challenge of Ativan. And if you look at the time here, 23, 20, 23, 37, 14, 23, 38. So a minute after, it's, a it's almost normal EEG. It's amazing how, you know, from this, you don't even see seizure here to this. Patient started blinking, woke up, uh, straight lines. So the point is, no matter how we teach resident fellows, no matter how we look at patients, we should always go back to the basics. We are not treating x-rays. We are not treating MRIs. We are not treating EEGs. Um, don't be shy of doing the challenge if you think there is a something doesn't make sense, even with, with an EEG that doesn't look status epilepticus. So I'm going to wrap up really quickly here, um, and I hope I'm not um, OK. Um, so there are a lot of challenges with the, dealing with the ectal and rectal pattern. I, I said most of them, you know, how benzos change it. Um, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, I think uh, Jared and uh, Corey are, are cussing me now. <laughs> Um, so um, let me go quickly over this. Um, so we talked about how to manage uh, these difficult uh, patterns. And uh, we talked about, um, you know, when they approach to the GPDs and the PDs, I'm going to quick. Oh. All right. So this is also another nightmare. So as if we need another confusing scenario. During uh, anesthesia withdrawal, some people develop like a GPDs that can range from one to four hertz, and they look really like a seizure. So you're withdrawing this um, anesthetic agent, and all of a sudden you see this, this is like a one hertz, um, you know, that resolve with time. Uh, within 48 hours, usually within 24 hours, it resolved. This is another one with uh, a little bit more um, frequent. And this one looks like a darn seizure. I mean, if you if you don't call this seizure, I don't know what would you call seizure. So you, ha you need an experienced epileptologist to take a look. And you, you need to take into consideration that patients previous seizures, if it's different, and if you know that you're uh, withdrawing the medications, you should call this uh, a pattern related to anesthetic withdrawal. Okay, conclusions uh, for the ectal and rectal. We said most of it, this is my last slide. So we lack evidence-based uh, in status epilepticus, and this is why um, attendings on neurology service deferred based on their level of confidence, their you know uh, level of practice, um, the patient, 
what what seizure medication they've been tried, the cases the patient, like the other medical illnesses the patient is on, uh, in loading different agents. Um, the status epilepticus mortality has not changed in the last 30 years. Forget about the length of seizure. I mean, we'll stop it. Forget about, uh, you know, the birth suppression. Look for etiology, 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 etiology. Um, we have insufficient evidence uh, relate uh, in, um, about the relationship of status epilepticus duration and its clinical outcome. Um, use, this is the most important, we said use the correct loading dose of the anti-seizure medications when you load. Um, birth suppression may not be the goal that we should aim for. Instead, it should be seizure suppression without suppressing all suppressing all EEG to flatline or birth suppression. Um, and continuous EEG and birth suppression or seizure uh, suppression should not be hands off, but it's time that it gives us time to um, reevaluate our treatment, order more tests or receive results um, and uh, look for etiology. And um, that's it. Uh, I think, again, have a very low threshold in the ICU to uh, do a challenge with anti-seizure medications or with um, with benzos, especially if the EEG is is uh, going on, and look for both uh, EEG um, absence of seizure and uh, improvement in clinical outcome. Um, I I don't know if if mischief has been managed or not. Maybe not. But at least now we know why we differ so much in in the approach, and uh, you know some attend, I mean, some people want to keep the EEG for seventy two hours. Some want to do only twenty four. We we really, I mean, nothing is like horribly wrong. Um, and if you, I bet you, if we want to reach a protocol and say this is what we are doing, I mean, I, I don't think people will. We don't have evidence to convince each other which one is. So each patient is different. I'll stop there and I'll take some threats from the audience. Yeah, James? Yes. So one of the things I find complicated clinically is that the cases where you see a crisp resolution of seizure and the patient is awake, maybe after the adamant challenge, sometimes after a single seizure medication is loaded rarely. But certainly after that, it's very ambiguous. Uh, might be seizure, it might be status, it might not be status, but it's certainly not normal. And then to intubate the patient, with Dr. Cohen or Dr. Greenberg intubates the patient for an anesthetic, you really feel the pressure to be aggressive because you can't keep the patient intubated forever. And also, the pattern is never, I've never seen a pattern after intubating where it's like, oh, it's back to normal now, so we'll just treat the occasional seizure. It's always on the verge of being status epilepticus, you know, in which case you either have to just be anxious about it or you have to put them on their. Um, and so if we could get to a point where you could say, oh, yeah, this patient's having intermittent seizures intubated on Adamant, I guess that would be useful, but I rarely see that pattern. It's always, this is an angry, on the verge of status epilepticus case, we've got to put it under. What do you think about that? Well, I'll tell you, when I was young and restless, I used to be very aggressive. Uh, I've learned over the years to be more on the conservative side. If it's not close to 99% seizure, I'll let it go. I don't know, Jake, you do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the more, when, when I first started fellowship um, three years ago, uh, they used to teach me like one hertz rhythmic is a seizure. Now it went to 2.5. Like we start this EEG in the ICU and somebody's LPD is like last week, LPD one hertz. We didn't do anything. We just, you know, the patient was on, we just watched it for, for two days, maybe. Yeah. Um, so I learned to be more conservative and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not chasing, I'm not doing birth suppressions anymore. It's just like seizure suppression. Yeah. So if there are just runs of seizures, then at that point, we get their own sanction. It could be 48 hours, it could be or whatever, and then move the patient and see what point we'll improve over time. Right. I'll do a follow up lecture on that specific topic. Would it be good? Because the way 
yeah, I was trying to be very different as well. You basically reset the clock. And you're not able to establish first impression. It's like within 48 hours because you screwed up. You know, so it's nice to know that those intermittent fluctuations don't necessarily mean you're not cooled off the brain, so to speak. Because it used to be the philosophy was the brain is inflamed. Right. You need to reset right. the inflamed brain, in which that pathophysiology really doesn't have any electrical clinical correlates. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I was taught we use birth suppression. It's like when your computer, you can't fix it anymore. You turn it off and you wait, you turn it back on and you pray that everything is going to go back to normal. This is what birth suppression is. So instead we should think about the CBD as being indicative of a struggling brain. The struggling brain is going to do well. So it's not a sedative sentence. Even more, I mean, some epileptologists in the AAS argue, I mean, very minute, uh, they argue that actually seizures are a defense mechanism that brain is trying to actually rewire and, you know, it shouldn't be aggressively treated, but these are just tiny, crazy people. If we have that in philosophy, then the question is why the seizures that do not resolve within two minutes fail to resolve? Because it seems so very Yeah, so it seems like that's tied to the fact that the struggling brain needs to be Right. That was amazing talk. I mean, uh, it's it's so humbling, you know, when you when you look at what is truly black and white in terms of evidence of the field. And uh, so I think I think the only the only thing I was going to say, just the comment was, uh, I mean, it was great. With the the two point five hertz, just in case, you know. Uh, it was sort of said in there, but it's, it doesn't pertain to like generalized rhythmic belt activity. Like that could be three hertz and still be just like a sublevel. I mean, if you really clinically think they're seizing, then sure, like like Dr. Like was saying, treat them. But but um, that that doesn't count as like epileptic, you know, just epileptic form discharge, just like generalized rhythmic, unless it's involved in or something like that. Yeah. Right. Could, yeah. could be in the correct clinical scenario in case he showed, but it's a lot less of a risk. C correct. So the the generalized rhythmic delta with the serpents, they are very low yield. I mean, they don't mean seizures. All right, our ICU people. I know that tremendous uncertainty exists when it comes to making a diagnosis. And the challenge in managing these patients, particularly the ones that don't have the classic monoclonic -monoc activity, is making that decision, yes or no, we're going to go after. Societal guidelines are usually developed when we have clear-cut evidence and clearly we do them. Would it be possible? I, I get that pontification is still necessary in making that decision, yes or no, we're going to go after. But given the dearth of evidence about second-line agent, third-line agent, once the decision is made that, yes, we are going to go after them, could we perhaps lead to create some degree of institutional protocolization such that we're not only escalating, but de-escalating in a similar, systematic, and anticipated way? I think so. Better do it now, it's just outside stuff. <laughs> 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 um, can I... I okay. I honestly, I think this is a good thing if we can do it, but it's gonna have a lot of, you know, arrows. That if this happens, because each patient is really honestly a little bit different than the other, and it depends on the etiology. I mean, we can try to come up with something like a. So the vast majority, in my anecdotal experience, the vast majority of the patients that we have on continuous EEG that are we're targeting birth suppression are usually the non-convulsive status epilepticus. And sometimes we'll have them on a single agent, they'll be on Keppra plus uh, uh, IV anesthetic drug. Other times they're on five drugs. And sometimes we're weaning, like right now, we're weaning the bursa by one milligram every four hours. And sometimes we'll be, I don't even know that we know what we're targeting or treating there's tremendous practice variability. And I get that we're going after a syndrome here, but we encounter the same issue in sepsis. And what we're finding in protocolizing or standardizing much of what we're doing, take vasopressors, for instance, there's very little evidence about second line agent, when to start a third, when you throw steroids at someone. 
we don't know. So we got together as a group and said, all right, when we reach that point, this is what we're going to do consistently so that nurse knows what to do, so that the residents know what to do, so that everybody is on the same page. And on the other end, this is how we take them off. And I think we're dealing with a similar situation with this where we don't even really know what we're treating. We're addressing a syndrome. We still need to clearly make the diagnosis to identify the ideology. And maybe that'll make some changes. But I think what we're hoping for in the ICU is some degree of consistency. Because right now, I think most of us are very comfortable saying, yep, yeah, I'm comfortable doing this. I'm comfortable doing this. But sometimes just that Monday when there's providers changing, the entire plan changes, we're on different drugs. And I think that just consistency in this case of uncertainty can in and of itself have some degree of benefit. Maybe not the patient who's in front of you, but for the population of patients as a whole. I mean, I totally agree with the principle. Reach, what do you think? I, I don't want to be the what the pessimistic one and say it's going to be really very hard to come up with. What do you think? It was beautiful. I, it, I would have loved to have. I mean, I remember you did that as soon as you got here. And I thought, okay, great. Right. I understand that there are tremendous limitations, but let's take this and run. Let's implement this. And it, yeah, I think I think it, you know we could start with that. It probably take some talking back and forth, you know. But I think I think we have a general kind of framework that you work from, and then you know we understand that there are situations we will have to meet for various reasons, but. I do agree with the handoff part of it. You know, just just keeping it consistent is very helpful for when you have a different night person, a different day person. So often you get called in the middle of the night and say, "What the heck was going on during the day?" You know, we don't. Have, what what would you do? And you know, it's like, well, I'm just reading the EG. I don't I don't really know exactly what to discuss clinically. Well, I advantage. so family has to have access. Sometimes I feel like the family doesn't know what the heck we're doing. Does he Oh boy, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Raj to, uh... <laughs> and so going on with the, with the same thing here, there, there's almost power in some of the data that you showed where there is no there's no choice of second agent that was better than the other. There's power in that, right? Because there's no wrong answer. And so to me, when I look at that data, some of it very recent in the last four years, it essentially says that it doesn't matter. And the same in invasopressors, right? And so I think that all of us as physicians have always thought that, well, I'm going to beat the system. I'm going to be able to pro to, in to individualize this person's care, and I'm going to beat the mean. But the reality is, in the population numbers, it's generally a regression to the mean. That when you take a subset of providers, it's it's going to regress to a to a 50% line. And so the one thing that we know that's across many societal guidelines. Society of Critical Care of Medicine, Society of Critical Care of Medicine, Neurosection, Neurocritical Care Society, um, uh, European Society, and, and various others, is that practice consistency within an intensive care environment is the only thing that's ever been shown to improve outcomes, decrease length of stay, and improve throughput, and all the other uh, financial things that care about. So to do that, there needs to be a line in the sand. And no one in our practice says, well, I'm on this protocol, now something else is happening and I can't deviate from it. But we monitor that. And if a deviation occurs enough, then we need to look at it that the protocol needs to modify. Um, it would be extremely helpful to the neuro ICU nursing staff, to the clinical pharmacists. And I think it would also decrease the anxiety that you're all talking about within your own practice by having some sort of standard that says, well, we institutionally start with a, then B, then C. This is when we consider birth suppression. If it's still indicated, um, my follow-up question was to be, how do you reconcile the uh, data on birth suppression versus the current society guidelines on it? Um, okay, it looks like right. yeah. fire you don't want to get into. Yep. And, and so, you know, you say, if this, then that. We benefit from having epileptologists, of which many facilities may not have, or may not have to the Abilities that, that both of you have. So, 
Uh, I would be all for it. And I think that having Dr. Kate here with you that, after we've got Boris Nation team with it, and being able to say, look, this is the law of the land for now. Um, well, I haven't seen a protocol in any place I worked with for this, uh, and there must be a reason for it. But that doesn't mean we cannot get take a stab at it, and um, at least in the first and second agents until we reach the anesthetics, and then we can definitely have a, a weaning protocol, weaning off like how fast and how quick. Um, it's just going to be complicated whether seizure recur or not, and what do you do with that. We can, we can, do you know of any place, Jake, that they have a protocol for this? So we used to have a protocol for specific things, like the Mayo had this, this um, search engine in, in the institution, you could look up protocols. So like, for example, someone comes up with cardiac arrest and is found to be in status. There's like a protocol that's based on expert opinion of like, you know, give them a trial with a few things and if it doesn't work. It, right, because it's probably more than toxic brain injury. So, kind of like they're saying, I mean, there's not really a lot of evidence behind that, but it can be helpful, especially with residents coming in. It can be very helpful, you know, to just sort of say, like, this is how it's done. This is culture. Yeah, this is how, how we do it. And, and um, this, there might have to be a couple protocols for different scenarios like that. But okay. We have the protocol. We have one at Vanderbilt for the neuro residents in terms of. What agent we started with first, second, third. And we also think I have an orange card from Vanderbilt. But I would like, I still have that. I would like for Random Life here also to tell the family we did something that is reasonable and it didn't work. Rather than we could put them in front of our two weeks when they're 96 years old. I mean, it's nice to have a stopping point, not a hard stopping point, but say, you know, at our institution, we do this, this, and this, and if it doesn't work, we can the majority of the time in this population or age group, it's not going to be successful. You never know when you that's that's the problem. I mean, remember we we are treating a symptom, not a di a disease. Yeah. We had cases at Vanderbilt. I remember specifically we took someone to hospital. We planned hospice. The hospital was going to pick them up the next day. They woke up and they walked out of the hospital. <laughs> we stopped all their seizure meds, all five of them. And the <laughs> well, that's not what we I know that's not the majority. That's right. not. That was a yeah. okay. It was very so, embarrassing. I've got a I've got a question. I'd love your opinion on. I guess it's the nuclear question, which is, is it felt that individualized AED escalation amongst a team of physicians, neurologists, is felt to be superior care? Individualized, like choice? Does their own thing. No, in that one. Uh, the answer is no. But again, remember, we're dealing with different patients every time so you know again you're gonna look at the kidney function the liver function and then you're gonna try to figure out whether it has some autoimmune component in it because some medication works better than others then if it's focal versus generalized some medication works for focal better than um, so a lot of things the answer is no it's always better to have a standardized but can we do it it's it's going to be very complicated Last question was actually uh, was after that. Would we see the medications that are better in generalized or partial or obviously kidney and renal functions while we have pharmacy and, and knowledge? Would we see that in the first, second, and third line choices, or do you think that that would get nulled out in the studies? You, you can you can start addressing it in the second uh, wave with the anti seizure medications after the benzos. ACS, sorry, we can, uh, I could ask you know, Tatum and them if they have any protocols that they can share or anything. Yeah, start with sure. They, just get they may not either really have anything they use they share. If there are some of the system, I just, I agree kind of, you know, I don't think they really follow it all that closely. It's the only thing, but it is technically there. Maybe they can share what they have. Any, any place where they have a protocol, we can look at it and see if it makes sense we can adopt it. And yeah, even there though, it was very like each neuro ICU person that did, you know, would treat this kind of a little differently. Like some really like ketamine, and they, you know, agent, other ones, yeah, 
I guess, I mean, all these years without evidence created people who are comfortable with certain things. This is how they do it. And yeah, it's extremely humbling. And, uh, you know, it, it does have a bit of a, this, this field has a bit of a guilt kind of nature where it's like, you know, you're in this little, this, you get trained in a place where you, everyone's convinced they're doing it the right way and everyone else is in this. And then, you know, there's really no evidence to say that's really true, right? It's just the people. That, yeah. That's the problem. It's like an echo chamber, right? It's like an echo chamber, like an institution. Yeah, exactly. Or something. Exactly. Or something. Exactly. So I mean, you can almost make it up. I mean, you can literally say we use Kepra and then load Fosfeni and like you just do it. Yeah. Obviously, I would defer to Jake. <laughs> no, no, but I think there's some truth to like, you know, there, there needs to be better studies that are validating this stuff. Agreed. Yeah, and we don't even know what we're targeting. But there's so much uncertainty and oftentimes discrepancy between what we see at the EEG, what we see clinically. Yeah. We really don't know. I, I, I mean, that's really where the art of treatment comes down to the initial decision of either we're yeah. going to go after this or we're not. And once you make that decision, yeah. we're going to go after it. Well, then you just follow. So we don't even really know what we're. What we're yeah. targeting as definitive endpoints. I think yeah. we just have to go. This is how we do it. Yeah, and I think I think you know you can divide it up into sort of you know suspected you know or definitive status, right? Like because I mean once you get to that two point five hertz, I mean it was set pretty conservatively. I feel like you know once you get to that point, it's it is the criteria that that is definitive status by definition. Is that a good criteria? A lot of evidence, you know, not really, but it was partly set conservatively just to be sure it was pretty accurate. And so I think once you get to that point, you know, we, we, before, as long as we're following ACS, or we know for sure this is a patient that we probably need to use to be aggressive with, then it comes down to those other factors, you know, that take the patient's patient scenario. And live. But a big element to bring though with this patient is going to have to be intubated for anesthetics because it's not going to be intubated if it's led alone. And we need to solve that question. That is that's that's that more bit here. I think that's one reason we're kind of conservative to not say like you need yeah, to make that patient is patient, but it's possible. Like, that patient is going to get your status in the for seven days. Was that really status or just ongoing seizures? It was sta focal status. Yeah, so those are the cases that worry me the most because we don't have evidence for the seizure meds. We have evidence that intubation harms patients and it's unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, and we don't want them intubated. So it's like, always <laughs> yeah. a dual, dual prompt argument, right? right? So yeah. if somebody has airway compromise from you know, failure, they get intubated. That's not a neurologic decision. That's like a physiology right. decision. But if we're electively intubating people for anesthetics, it, no matter what, you're going to have some sort of morbidity from it. I think the question that we're saying is, what is that line? Right. What do you try yeah. first? Do you go one to two then for suppression anesthetic? Do you go one to two then three? Want to make sure that we are always giving more than two of Ativan in a rapid response? Yeah. Does that? Yes. That's yes. what we definitely do. Yes. You know, I mean, that part we're sure of. You know, there's, there, there's these things where there's, there's minimum changes to do. Let's say you give up the A, then we're going to start worrying about the patient's respiratory status. Well, yeah. Don't. There's no evidence don't. to show that giving that is that is not going to be restricted. Agree. Agree wholeheartedly. Uh, I mean, we give 260 IV for an hour for. So there's easy targets to do, but we do know that when we intubate somebody, where we have people with practice variation, significant practice variation, and those can be a little bit. All of those markers that were displayed of pneumonia and tracheostomy and long-term ICU state go up. They go up. They, your IC doesn't turn over. Your neuro ICU gets dumped up. Recent, and it happens yeah. in, in ours as well with sepsis care and antibiotic changes. And, yeah, I think it's a really, really important point. I guess last point we're probably going to go certain clinic patients who complain like eight, eight strokes. Eight strokes. <laughs> no, he doesn't want to retard. He's going to say. Um, the other point is, you know, you have to be really, really careful with um, generalized direct discharges to look for the etiology, like like we was saying, because so often we just get the diagnosis of it's not convulsive status, but why in this thirty-year-old person who never had a seizure in their life, you know, and you do potentially really affect the treatment of the encephalopathy that could actually be causing that same pattern. You know, it's not the EG alone it's not telling you what the cause is, right? It could just be the encephalopathy. So it's like you really set them back over treating. And that's where I think, you know, that's agreed. Uh, but even more so, you know, let's have uh, a standardized yeah. you know, evaluation, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
this is when we do the MRI. Let's do an LP. Like, you know, yeah, sometimes yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, we'll wait on the LP five days. And we're like, well, <laughs> what do it? Yeah. That's yeah. like a good percent of time we have the fast cars, which is. That's yeah. about consistent yeah. with Norse studies in general, about 50%. Okay, you don't know. Um, but it's great, great discussion and uh, action. Thank you guys for your uh, You're doing a lot.